In the last few years, we've started recognizing a lot of non-classical effects, and this is perhaps the more interesting, well, certainly for me, the more interesting part of vitamin D metabolism and regulation, and I think for all of you is probably uh, more interesting as well. And what we've recognized is that vitamin D is critical in all types of cellular um, uh, activities. In fact, it's, uh, vitamin D receptors are found in almost every major cell type, cardiac, or muscular, neural, you name it, it has a vitamin D receptor in that cell. I, mean, I, I always marvel at the fact that you know, this, all this was only discovered about a decade ago, despite all this you know, fantastic medical research. About a decade ago was the first paper that came out and said, wow, cardiac cells have vitamin D receptors on them. Why? And that's what really started uh, our interest in this. And um, so cells not only, of all these major cells, not only have uh, vitamin D receptors in them, they also uh, have this enzyme, which is the 25-1-alpha-hydroxylase. Alpha, and that's a really critical difference uh, between our previous understanding and our current understanding. What this suggests is that all major cell types, if they need to, can convert 25-hydroxyvitamin D to its main major metabolically active form, which is the 125-dihydroxyvitamin D. And this has really opened up our, uh, our vision of, of what vitamin D has, or, or vitamin D's implications to target tissues. And if you look at studies, uh, and the only one that I've put here, because that's the one that's really been studied the most, is if you look at immune response. So vitamin D causes an upregulation of your uh, innate, uh, uh, what's called an immune system, so phagocytes go up. But as a byproduct of, of that, it also causes expression of something called catalytins or LL37, which are naturally occurring antimicrobial peptides that occur at barrier sites. So respiratory, mucus lining, urinary, and these LL37s basically guard the, the, the cell. So, you know, everybody talks about, you know, the skin is your greatest barrier, it's the, the best thing that you have. Well, it's actually these LL37s in your uh, mucosal lining which are responsible for the antimicrobial activity. It's antibacterial, antiviral, antifungal, uh, it, you know, uh, it also works against um, uh, tuberculosis. And we, what we see is that once, as you go higher and higher, so if you started from a theoretical zero 25-hydroxyvitamin D and you start going up, as you increase that value of your systemic 25-hydroxyvitamin uh, D level, your expression of LL37 or these proteins starts increasing. Once you hit about 30, it starts plateauing, and once you hit about 35, you really plateaued out. So once you start going above 35, you don't get a, uh, a better response in terms of more uh, LL37 expression. So from the non-classical effects, you can see that it kind of mirrors some of the classical effect data that, you know, that, that 30 really seems to be kind of a magic number, that you really need to be above that number to get both classical and non-classical effects. All right, let's see if we're back up, back up. All right, so in terms of um, medical conditions, all right, so acute respiratory infections, what do we know about this? So if you look at the studies that Gindi and Barry, and all the references are there, so if you ha have access to electronic uh, uh, PubMed or whatever, you can actually pull all of these up if you'd like. Uh, or I, you can email me, I'll send you the paper if you want as well. Uh, so Gindi and Barry, what did they do? They did retrospective observational studies, huge registries, right? Gindi looked at about 19,000 people in the U.S., Barry looked at about 7,000 people in England. Two different continents, and what did they find? So if you looked at that magic number 30, Gindi shows that there is definitely an increase in the risk of acute respiratory infections if your levels are below 30. Uh, and now that you're all experts in odds ratios, when you look at that number, you look at that, you say, oh, odds ratio 1.24, which means there's a 24% higher risk of having an acute respiratory infection if you're below 30. And I am 95% sure that that risk is 7% to 43%. That's what that confidence interval is telling me. Barry, on the other hand, looked at things a little bit differently. What she did was she looked at if you take this theoretical number of zero and you start working up towards an increasing level, and they took it up to about 100, and they showed that at every 4 nanogram per ml increase was associated with a reduction of about 7% in the risk of so Barry is one of the very few people that have actually shown that there may be some benefit in terms of going higher and higher. 
the problem is that this is a retrospective study. It's observational. The next two studies are uh, prospective trials. Um, if you have the hand, I'll go to the bottom first. It's, uh, it's a really neat trial. So this in Finland where they took about 750, 170 uh, people in the military young, and they looked at D levels and looked at work deism from upper respiratory tract infections. And they showed that in fact, if, if you have low, I think there was less than 16 nanograms per ml, that your chances of missing work because of a respiratory tract infection was significantly higher. So when you're trying to make this argument about, you know, should my levels be higher or not, there's that little financial thing saying, hey, there's a, an impact to the overall economy. Uh, and let's see. So we have cash now. Uh, so moving on from uh, acute respiratory infections, where the majority of work has been up to this point for acute stress, a lot of people are now looking at myocardial infarctions. And this is just starting to come out. The data, you know, the first few studies have really come out in like the last year, year and a half or so. But what we do see is that about 95% of people that come in for a confirmed heart attack have significantly low vitamin D levels. So there is this, definitely there is this association. Um, and what will, be, what will be interesting and what some people are looking at is what happens to vitamin D as you've had a heart attack and you're sort of going through. Uh, convalescence. Yes. So, I mean, if you look at the general general population of the U.S., it's actually 60 to 80. So, you know, 50. Sorry. No, no, no. 60 to 80 percent are insufficient. So, you know, even a 10, you know, 15 percent difference is pretty dramatic if you're looking at just one condition, right? And this was actually done in, in uh, New England. So, 95 percent of them showing up, and the, the average in New England is probably close to about 70 percent. So there is a pretty dramatic difference there. Um, you, know, you guys in Southern California lead a, lead a much healthier lifestyle. So, <laughs> you know, you might not see all these people showing up with MIs. Um, but, uh, and what we're also starting to see is that when, so like I said, the interesting thing would be to see what happens to vitamin D as you're recovering from your heart attack. But what we do know when we look at surrogate markers, so markers that would suggest developing heart failure or having uh, you know, complications after your heart attack, all of those are negatively associated with your vitamin D levels. So you come in with low vitamin D levels at the time of your heart attack, it increases your chances of having heart failure after, it uh, increases your risk of having a, you know, mitral, uh, a mitral um, valve uh, calcification, it increases your chances of having aneurysmal disease, all those start going up. So it looks like there is an association that just hasn't really been investigated all that well. Uh, and then I'll, I'll kind of take you to sort of my personal journey over here, and this is my interest, which is healthcare-associated infections. And everybody says, why is an anesthesiologist interested in vitamin D? You know, you should be happy just passing gas. But, you know, so I not only pass gas for a living, but I also take care of very, very sick people in the ICU. And what always struck me as being really interesting about the whole ICU environment is we try to sterilize the environment. Kind of come up with all these exogenous things that we can dump into people and hope that we're going to have this dramatic outcome. And I, and I you know, one day, you know, I was probably like two or three in the morning, we had a really, really busy night, and I had the first time that I got to sit back and think about this. And it's like, you know, the human body is like the most incredible thing. It's the most versatile, most adaptive thing. There has to be something that we can do to boost the natural immune system. And that's what really got me interested in looking at this. So I went on PubMed, and I was like natural, you know, immune boosting. And I saw my first paper on vitamin D where it was done in animals. It was actually cows that had um, severe mastitis uh, with Staph aureus, got treated with ridiculously high doses of vitamin D, and actually cured the mastitis. So, wow, this is interesting. And then that really led me down the path of trying to figure out, does vitamin D have a role in, in, in critical illness and infections? And so, you know, my interest is healthcare-associated infections. And for those of you that might be familiar with it, uh, you, you probably recognize that about 1.7 million people are exposed to healthcare-associated infections every year. And, you know, what do we, what do we mean by healthcare-associated infections? So there's surgical site infections, bacteremias, pneumonia, UTIs, you know, pretty much a lot of the things that you probably see in your practice as well. It might not be as severe as the stuff that I see, but, you know, we all see this. And about 100,000 people die every year because of these healthcare associated infections. So wouldn't it be nice if we could come up with a way to intervene, and a pretty low cost way to intervene that uses the natural defense system in the body. So that's where my interest really uh, came up. And uh, 
this is unpublished data, so please don't go around advertising it and saying that, yeah, you know, this does this, it does that. You know, it'll come out in like the next month or so. It's already been accepted. It's, it's in press. But what we showed is that we took um, gastric bypass surgery patients. So they're obviously obese and they're high risk for low vitamin D levels. Because of their obesity, they're also high risk of surgical site infection. So that's an ideal population. And most people would say, well, no, that really biases the data because you're looking at these people that have a high risk of vitamin D deficiency and all that. But what we did was we looked at only people that had laparoscopic surgery. So the risk of having a surgical site infection with laparoscopic surgery is way low. So open surgery, 20 to 30 percent. Laparoscopic surgery, 2 to 5 percent. Despite that, what we showed was that the risk of having a postoperative health um, healthcare associated infection was all it was 2.5 fold. And the, the, the risk of having a surgical site infection was about threefold if your vitamin D levels were deficient, which is less than 20. And we just did a follow up analysis looking at insufficiency, 30, and both of those actually turned out to be around four. So, four fold risk of having an HAR and SSI if your levels are low uh, when you come to the surgery. And you can kind of translate that to any condition that you think an acutely stressful, situation where your immune system is going to be suppressed.